Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. Hey, good morning. I'm Joel. I'm the teaching guy here, and uh, we are continuing our series today called It's Complicated, where we're talking about relationships, because there is not much in the world more complicated than relationships. Uh, Rocket science, it's complicated, but your husband way more complicated. Your wife, way more complicated. You're about that guy that came, God came to him and he said, hey, I'll give you anything you want. Just ask. And the guy's like, really, Lord? He's like, yeah, anything you want. He says, you know, I'm just terrified to fly. Could you, could you build a bridge to Hawaii so I could drive? And God's like, oh, man. I could, but the logistics of that, it's just way too much work. And he's like, ask for something else. And the guy's like, all right. He's like, you know, would you help me understand women? And God's like, you want that to be a two or four lane highway? (laughs) Just kidding. Man, it's a little joke. It could go the reverse way too for men, right? So we're complicated. Before we get started, hey, we have a men's uh, retreat coming up. And look, I understand men because I am one, and we do not like retreats. We don't even like the word retreat. We're like, retreat, I want to advance, man. Yeah. Look, this retreat is like no other retreat you've been on. I guarantee it. Been hanging out in the church for 45 years. Every time I go to these things, I'm like, this is a thing for men, for sure. So I would encourage you, we want you to be at that event, and we're not going to do any weird stuff. I've been a part of men's retreats where they make men strip off their shirts and run through a field naked, screaming, and then carry a cross on their shoulder. We don't do any of that. (laughs) Weird retreats. I didn't get invited back to those. But anyway, (laughs) we won't do any of that. This won't be weird. I guarantee it. I want to encourage you guys to come. We're going to talk about stuff that's real struggles that men face. I mean, you know how the church is, real God, real people. It'll be a real talk about stuff we're dealing with, and I want to encourage you to come and check it out. I'm actually going to, I get to be one of the speakers this year. Um, Our buddy John James, former lead singer of the Newsboys, is going to be coming. So it's going to be a good crowd. Pastor Marcus is going to lead us off. So I would encourage you to come. Here's the thing that we do at this church. We don't want finances to get in in the way of anybody being able to come that wants to join us for this, okay? We do it at this Primo Retreat Center, like I always tell the women, don't ever go check out where we do ours because you're going to be like, man, why don't we get to do our retreat at that place? It's this awesome retreat center in Wimberley. Uh, It's super nice. Uh, You won't be, trust me, you're not going to be, anyways, it's really nice. Just trust me. I don't like retreats either, but go to this thing. You'll be glad you did. But what we do is we do a brisket plate fundraiser and we're doing that today. So I know you're going to get out of here, hopefully uh, uh, at, uh, we'll say 10.05, On your way out, pick up some brisket plates and, you know, they've got a a donation price, but I would encourage you, man, just give towards this. We want to make it to where any guy that wants to go can go. And a lot of guys, it's financially prohibitive and they just go, I can't afford this. I got stuff my family needs. Anybody that wants to go, if you want to go, we're going to make it happen for you. And there's people in here that are going to give. And if you feel like maybe you're saying, well, I'm already booked those dates, but I want to give, you know, $300 for somebody else to go. Hey, do that. Pay it forward. Uh, And just, we just want to make sure that this is available to anyone that wants it. And then we're doing that brisket plate. So go out there and these guys know how to cook brisket. So it's going to be really good. It is brisket, right? right. Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay. <laughs> They're like, this is sausage. Anyway. <laughs> All right. So um, a few years ago, I had a pastor do me dirty. He done me dirty. Not only me, he totally burned my entire family. Like my dad, like when we talk about this, I I told Emily, I'm like, I'm sick of talking about this guy, but he's the best example of a horrible person I know. So (laughs) this pastor, he did a horrible thing to my family and me. You got church hurt. I can probably compete with it. I've been hanging out in the church for 45 years. I got lots of it. Okay. He did us so bad. He left both of us without a job. And it's one thing for me. I was in my thirties, but my dad was like in his sixties when this happened. And my dad had to start over again from scratch because of this pastor and lies he told about us. He did horrible, horrible things. Now, I always think I've gotten over it. But once a year, I go speak at a church that's three blocks away from his church. And his church, when I drive by it, there are thousands of people attending it. 
And I drive by and I go, that ain't right. That guy is still out there doing his narcissistic thing. And now listen, here's the weird thing. God still uses people like that. And I don't understand why. But every time I drive by it, I'm like, that's not right. He's still, he's got everything he wanted. And he's still probably hurting people because narcissists don't tend to change. But I drive by and I go, that's not right. And I have to check my heart every time I drive by it because I'm like, that SOB got away with it. (laughs) And the worst part is some people believe his side of the story still. And they're like, well, you really treated him bad. I'm like, (laughs) me? What? You don't even know what happened because all you heard was his side of the story. And it pisses me off. And his initials are empty. (laughs) Here's the crazy part. Marcus and Natalie know this goober too. Anyway, he's irrelevant. Here's what's what's relevant when it comes to what we're talking about, okay? Every one of us in this room, I hope you haven't been done dirty by a pastor. But I know that you've got something that when you look at it, you say the same thing as me. It is just not right. It is not right that my brother got away with taking my mom's money when she had lost her mind to dementia. He took all that money. He's using it, do whatever he wants. I've been all responsible, and he's just living, living like hell out there doing whatever he wants with mom's money. That's not right. That's literally something I've heard people say. It is not right that I'm still over here single raising these kids, and he's off running around doing whatever he wants. It's not right. It's not right that the boss, he like just abuses people and we all like surrender to whatever he says and he gets away with it and he keeps getting promotions and getting paid more and we're all getting pay cuts, but they're getting pay raises. It's not right. It's just not right. When it gets this quiet, I know everybody's got it one. You got something in your life, you look at it right now, you're just not right, man. Sometimes it's because of misunderstandings, but sometimes it's just blatantly not right. And it seems like injustice is running rampant and they got away with it. And every time you see them, like there's a place, there's some places you won't even drive by because you're like, talk to a guy one time, his wife, he found his wife cheating on him at this one hotel. So for years, he drove the long way to a work to avoid that one hotel because he's like, man, it's just not right. And he forgave her. But he's like, every time I drive by that hotel, it comes back up. And I'm like, ah, it's just not right. She, she got away with it. So we've been talking about relationships and how complicated they are. Last week, we looked at 1 Corinthians 13, which is kind of the description of how you know. And you know, everybody, we like to all think we're loving. I'm a loving person. But you can really figure out if you're a loving person by looking at 1 Corinthians 13. And you go, am I these things? Because if I am, I'm a loving person. If I'm not, I got some work to do. Love is patient. We talked about how that complicated that is. But patience is just walking the pace that somebody else is walking, even if you wish you could go a little bit faster walking along with them. But it's also complicated because sometimes you have to push people a little bit to go a little further than they think they can go. My daughter inf- requires infinite patience. If it were up to, if I had to walk at her pace all the time, we would never get anywhere. <laughs> sometimes I got to push her a little bit. Love is kind. Sometimes kindness means telling people that it's things they don't want to hear. Now, you don't got to do it mean. But sometimes you have to say things that are like, well, that hurts my feelings. I understand, but if you don't, under, but if you don't, if nobody tells you this, you're going to walk right into disaster. It doesn't envy. Talked about how you know you got a true friend on your hands when they're willing to celebrate your victories as well as your defeats. Everybody likes being around to rescue somebody that's had a hard time. But do you have a friend that's with you to celebrate when you have a win? And they're like, man, all the bad things that have happened to you, I'm so glad good things are happening to you. Or are these your friends that are like, they don't know what to do when good things happen to you because they just want to be there to rescue you when bad things happen to you. It's true love is willing to celebrate your victories as well. It doesn't boast. It's not proud. It does not dishonor others. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. And this is the one I hate. It keeps no record of wrongs. Because it's hard to not keep a record of wrongs. In fact, we're talking a minute in a minute about the idea that this idea of forgive and forget, that's impossible. If anybody tells you forgive and forget, they're in denial. Right. Right. Because you can't forget. 
When you've been done dirty, it's like you always remember it. And something will trigger it out of nowhere. You thought you would let it go, and then something goes, oh, and you're like, ah, it's not right. So we've all got these things in our life. And it's complicated. What's really complicated is you may be married to somebody who has done you so many hurts. And it's like these little micro injuries. I hate the word microaggressions because it's been co-opted, but these little micro things that have happened have built up. And all of a sudden, one day you wake up and you're like, I don't like this person anymore. And you thought you were a forgiving person, but one day you just go, I I can't do it anymore. C.S. Lewis, he said this, to be a Christian means to forgive the inexcusable because God has forgiven the inexcusable in you. Yes. Good. That's hard because I know for a fact your sin is worse than mine. <laughs> Y'all are way worse than me. Isn't that how we think? Right. Yeah. Well, yeah, I did some bad stuff, but what she did, whoa, un- inexcusable. Mm. The, the, the really enlightening thing and frightening, and maybe this is why we don't look at it, is, is, is we never compare ourselves to what we did to God. And when you stand to a perfect God who gave us everything and we turned our back on him and did our own thing for a long time, and some of us, oftentimes we're still doing it, even after we know he loves us and he forgave us, and we're like, I did it to him again. The, the, the foundation of our faith is one man shouldering everything that was ever done against him and not holding it against the people who did that to him. You go, that's forgiveness. That's the foundation of our faith. And and I don't think there's anything more important for us to learn. If you can get this thing right, pretty much everything else resolves itself. I'm not kidding. I mean, like I said, I've been in the church for a long time, and I've just seen, until you get this right, it's really hard to get anything else right. And here's the really wild thing about this. As a counselor, and there's increasing scientific evidence of this, Choosing to hold on to unforgiveness is actually self-destruction. Yeah. There's a book called The Body Keeps the Score and another one by a guy named Gabor Mate. And Gabor, Gabor Mate, I saw this, there's an interesting, Google, I put, put his name in on Netflix, Gabor, G-A-B-O-R Mate. He has this documentary about how he goes and helps people heal naturally from, from cancer and things. And he says that in the majority of cases, he's found that people that are struggling with a autoimmune de- deficiency, cancers, now not always, but he says in the majority of cases, if you get down to the bottom of it, somewhere they've got some major resentment, bitterness, or unforgiveness in their heart. And oftentimes there are miraculous cures when they choose to let go of that thing that those people did to them years ago that they've been holding and harboring. It's not always the case, but he says, he says I mean, I think he interviews this one guy. He said, I've just found in my life most of the time, there's some sort of unforgiveness. And then he'll unpack all this stuff that happened with a guy's father or with her mother or whatever. And this is a scientist. He doesn't, I don't even know if he believes in God, but he just says it's just the bottom line. When you choose to hold on to that resentment and bitterness, the chemicals it releases in your body and the destruction, it's like, it's been said, it's like drinking poison and hoping somebody else will die. Yeah. Just imagine, just round up. Just take round up and gently suck on that for a month. That's what it's doing. Because here's the worst part about it, man. The people that done you dirty, they've moved on. If they're a narcissist, they don't even care what they did to you. You were just a tool to get what they wanted. They've moved on, and you're sitting here just bitter and resentful over it. And here, I, I think we all know we need to forgive. We know, right? In fact, Peter, there's this interesting time where Peter, Peter, I just love Peter. He, he says what everybody, out loud what everybody else is thinking. He comes to Jesus and he goes, hey, Jesus, all right, cool. I know we got to forgive, right? But he says, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Like, I, I'm not going to set myself as a victim for abuse. How often do I have to forgive him? Like, seven times is like, okay, seven times, you're done. I'm done forgiving you. No soup for you. You're out of the club, right? <laughs> It's a Seinfeld reference. Jesus said to him, nope, not seven times, 77 times, which it, it, many scholars say is symbolic of unlimited. Then he tells this story about this guy, and uh, he owes this king, it's like millions of dollars. The king calls in the debt, he says, hey, 
uh, you got to pay up the debt. And the guy's like, I can't pay the debt. The king just has this moment of kindness. He's like, all right, whatever. You're paid off. Instant college debt forgiveness. <laughs> no Supreme Court, just knock it down. You're forgiven. And the guy's like, yes. So he heads out. On his way out, he runs into a dude that owes him a few bucks. And he's like, hey, man, you owe me money. And the guy's like, oh, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't pay it. Anyways, he, he brings this suit against the guy who just got forgiven millions of dollars. He brings this suit against this guy and gets him thrown in prison for this tiny little debt he owes. Well, the king gets the word about this, and the king gets really mad. So this master of the king, he summoned him and said to him, hey, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me, you pleaded with me. Should you have not had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in his anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. And this is a very uncomfortable verse. I don't know what to do with this. He says, so also, my loving, gracious, kind, wonderful father will do to every one of you if you don't forgive your brother from your heart. What will he do? Turn him over to the jailers to pay all his debt. In fact, one version that says to be tortured, tormented. Wait, what? Sweet, loving God, Jesus, what? For, what? I don't know what to do with that verse. It, it screws up my theology. But I think Jesus is trying, because my, my theology is like, well, he forgives you and then all is good. Oh, he says, if you don't forgive, the bet's off. Really messes with my theology. But it's in there. I got to deal with it. What I think the point is, is Jesus is trying to say, hey, you got to get this right. Because if you don't get this right, you're going to be turning yourself over to torture. And you're doing it to yourself. Like, I want to forgive all your debts, but if you can't forgive others, like, you're just going to let yourself be tortured for the rest of your life. And it's not doing anybody good. And you think, well, I'm holding it against them. I've got leverage over them. They don't care. They don't care. So I want to talk real quick about some of the myths that we've heard about forgiveness. And I want to debunk them, all right? So the first one I hear all the time is this. Well, they have to apologize first or admit their guilt before I can forgive. <laughs> nope. Thank God Jesus didn't play that game. He said, Father, hanging on the cross, bloody, beaten. Father, forgive them. They don't even know what they're doing. Forgiveness is in your court any moment of the day. You can forgive right now, and it's just a decision. Just like, I, I don't have to wait for them to apologize. And here's the thing. I mean, your dad, he may have passed away. He's never going to be able to apologize. If you're waiting for him to come in a dream and apologize, it's not going to happen. Maybe it'll happen, but I doubt it will. You don't have to wait for them to apologize. The ball is in your court. Forgiveness is always in your court, which is a really empowering feeling. You don't have to be a victim of whatever they did to you. Your father, your mother, your brother, your boss, your pastor. It's in your court, and you get to decide how long you want to keep sucking on the roundup. Jesus forgave before we knew we needed forgiveness. And he says, now you go and do the same. Forgive. It's not, it's, it's actually mandatory, but everything God asks of us is for our own good. So here's the next one. Well, I'll just know when it's the right time. I'll feel it. Listen, there's two schools of psychological thought, like there's these two spectrums. One is like to get healing and, and stuff, you've got to dig up the past. And then once you've dig, dug up the past, then you can move forward with a new perspective. That's what you would call like psychoanalytic theory, right? It's looking in the past. If Freud came up with that, kind of dig in the past. Then there's another thing called behavioralism, right? Skinner was the guy, that was a be and he says, look, you just start doing the right thing and the good feelings will follow. I think AA, they call it fake it till you make it. I'm perfectly balanced in the middle. I'm just kidding, I'm not. But I think there's truth to both of those. The good feelings of forgiveness will follow your decision. That's right. That's good. But you're probably not going to get the good feeling before because they did you wrong. Yeah. And I get it. 
But you have to say, no, I'm, I'm going to make a decision to forgive and I'm going to walk in that. And as you walk in it, forgiveness becomes easier and easier. And it's not a one-time process. Well, the forgiveness is a one-time decision, but here's the, the thing. It's cyclical because the next myth is this. You should forgive and forget. You can't forget. It's just, a, you just can't forget. I mean, if you truly have forgotten, it's because it was probably so traumatic in your childhood mind that you buried it, but it's still affecting you. Okay? So trying to forget a hurt is nearly impossible. As Christians, we are called to forgive and remember with forgiveness. You make the decision. You say, man, I forgive my dad. He didn't know what he was doing, or he did know what he was doing, but I still forgive him because I'm not going to be his victim anymore. I forgive my husband, my ex-husband. He knew what he was doing, but I forgive him. But here's the challenge of it. Forgiveness involves grieving. And grieving, you know, the, the, the process of grief, they say, you know, there's denial and anger and all this stuff. It makes it sound like it's linear. Grief is not linear. Grief is a spiral, okay? So it means you come back around a day, a month, a year, two years, five years, and you wake up with the feelings so heavy on you as, as if it was the day it happened. You know this if you've lost someone you love. It's like, man, the, just the sadness and the grief comes over you like this weight. And you go, man, I thought I was over this. And it just comes back and smacks you upside the head. Forgiveness is the same way because it involves grieving. Somebody took something from you. Your innocence, money, love, your ideal ending, whatever it is they took from you. It's going to come back around. You're going to go, that's just not right. Every year when I drive past that church, ah, it's just not right. He got away with it. And you have to go, but I forgave him. And I choose to remember with forgiveness. And eventually the spiral gets wider and wider. Like I said, I don't like talking about this guy because I, I truly have forgiven him. But you have to, when that moment comes back around, you're like, oh, uh, ah, nope, I chose to forgive him. And you remind yourself. And you fake it till you make it for a few hours. Remind yourself, no, I, I forgave him. And the feelings follow the action. But you got to take action first on it. Okay. You don't sit around waiting for them to apologize. And, and, because here's what's at stake, okay? One of the most important verses, I think, in the Bible. They're all important, but one of the most important is this one. King Solomon, he says, above all, guard your heart. Yeah. Everything you do flows from it. A few years ago, I took a team rafting in the Grand Canyon. And we started way up north place called Lee's Ferry. And there, the, the canyon there is not a canyon. It's just like a little dip in the ground. The Grand Canyon, the, the river that runs through the Colorado is crystal clear. I mean, it is crystal clear and it is cold water coming straight off the mountains. I, it's amazing. You could take a GoPro and take all these underwater shots. But about an hour, an hour into the rafting, we were going to raft the entire Grand Canyon. Our guide, he said, well, looks like the Priya is running. Say goodbye to the clear water for the rest of your trip. It's like, what, what, what is it? What, what do you mean? It's like super clear. And, and we look up to the right, and there's this gushing mud stream. It's tiny. It's not very big. Gushing stream of mud coming into the crystal clear Colorado River. And for the next seven days on the river, we couldn't see a thing. The crystal clear waters were murky and brown and disgusting. And you'd get in the river, and you'd get out, and you'd be like, I feel dirt all over me. I think that's a picture of what happens when we allow unforgiveness to purify the clear stream. Like, there's this clear stream God wants us to have in our heart, flowing out, giving life to people. But when forgiveness comes in, it's like that Perea. It's just this mud that just gets in and muddies everything. And you can't see anything clearly anymore. You get so bitter and resentful, maybe cynical of people. You go, oh, people are always this way or that way. And you start to just, you can't see clearly anymore because all you can see is the pain of what happened to you. And it's up to you to purify it. One of the things I do on my outdoor adventure hikes is I, I, I learned early on to buy really, really, really expensive water purification filters. I've got this one. It's the first need water purification filter. It's the best thing on the market. When, when, it, when people see it and they know their water pur purification filters, they're like, dude, that's expensive. I'm like, yeah, it is. This thing, you could pump water out of a cesspool and it would be drinkable. Yeah. It's it, like, nobody believes me, but I've done it, Okay. <laughs> So every night when we're at base camp, what we do is we sit around in a circle and we take, we get water from the river and we put it in the middle and we all take turns pumping clean water into our Nalgene's for the next day. And we have to be really careful because man, if any water splashes into your, you know, I'm like, I was like very sanitary about it. I'm like, make sure it only goes into this place. And we pump out the dirty water and we make it clear for the next day. 
so that we don't get sick while we're hiking, but you need that water. And I think that's a picture of what we should kind of do every day in our lives. I think we need to just get used to every night going, man, a lot of bad stuff happened to me today. But choosing to forgive and not let the sun set without us coming to the Lord and saying, Lord, I'm surrendering this to you. I'm giving this to you. I'm, man, I feel angry. I feel like it was unjust. And look, sometimes it takes us a few days, a few weeks, a few months, a few years to figure out how upset we are about what happened to us. But when it comes to light and you begin to see, oh, this water is tainted. The most important thing you can do is get in a circle. Get with some other people. Say, I need to work through this. You need to get in a safe place. You know, you need somebody that's, maybe you need somebody that's trained in how to walk people through forgiveness. I don't, I mean, I don't know anybody better in this church than Pastor Marcus and Natalie to walk you through that too. Uh, and there's other staff that we have that can walk you through how to deal with that. If it's something really deep. But I think a lot of times what it is, is just those little things that build up. And before you know it in your marriage, you've got this resentment towards the person you're married to. You don't really even like them anymore. It's just because the little things you allowed them to build and the water got tainted. But this is so important, you guys. Like, if you, if you can't get this right, it's, you can miss so much that God has for you. It can be causing you physical illnesses and you don't even realize it. And this is a constant... I, I've talked about this before, but I think we probably need a, about a, every three months to talk about forgiveness because it's the foundation of our faith, but it's also the quickest way to derail us from the life that God has for us because there's no way to get around it. People are gonna hurt you. And it ain't right. And there's some people saying the same thing about you that you say about them. And our goal is to go, okay, God, and I just pray, first of all, forgive, forgive those who have sinned against me, but also I, I, I need forgiveness. And here's the really important part. Some of you need to forgive yourself. God forgave you. Who do you think you are? hold something against yourself that God already forgave. And here's a really tricky one. I'm going to open a can of worms here, but some of you need to forgive God. Now listen, can you forgive somebody who never did anything wrong to you? Because God never did you wrong. Never did you wrong. But in our minds, sometimes we go, God, why did you allow that to happen? And, and you know what? I don't think he minds your questions. Go to him. Yell at him a little bit. God, you let that happen. You were watching while this happened. What happened? He can take it. Go to him. And recognize he loves you. And he's okay with your questions. And you say, are you really forgiving God? Eh. No, but just acknowledging that the hurt is there is super important. Because oftentimes our whole view of things is wrapped up in God. Let that happen. And why did he let that happen? And you need to wrestle through that. So my encouragement to you guys, get this right this week. Like, or start the process. Sometimes it takes a little while to kind of unpack what happened. There's a version devotional I wrote. Um, it's available free on the Bible app. So if you've got, this is actually one of the most read devotionals I've written. It's called The Power to Forgive. It's a five-day devotional. It's got a lot of Bible verses, a lot of the stuff I talked about today. But I would encourage you to walk through that and just begin to go, Lord, where are some areas where I'm still letting that unforgiveness taint the way I see the world, taint the way I see my spouse, taint the way I see my new spouse? Taint the way I see my ex-spouse. Taint the way I see my kids because of what my dad did to me. Whatever it is. But I want to encourage you, man, get this right. This is super, super, super important. And when you do it, don't be surprised if, first of all, if scales fall off your eyes and you begin to see the world with a whole new set of eyes and you go, wow, there's a whole lot of beauty and wonderful things out there. And also don't be surprised if God begins to take you to the next level. And he takes you to places you go, wow, I didn't even think this was possible. But it was because you opened up your heart to his healing. And instead of holding on to that thing that they did to you, you go, I'm going to let that go. And then there's this space there that God says, ah, now I can come in and fill that spot. And he fills you with this deep sense of love and peace. And all the anxiety goes away. But you have to make room by letting it go first. So I would encourage you this morning, whatever it is, sometimes we have to let go of stuff we thought we'd already let go of, but you have to do it to a deeper level. Deep hurt sometimes requires multiple layers of forgiveness because you realize, wow, that was taken from me, and that was taken, and that too was taken from me. But you forgive. And we live in a world right now that doesn't have a lot of forgiveness. You notice they love to dredge up stuff that people did 10, 15, 20 years ago, all in the name of moral purity. 
But what that is, is that's actually a lack of forgiveness. And it's very unchristian. Forgiveness says, I don't care what happened, and it wasn't right. It doesn't mean it's right to forgive, but it is right for me to forgive. It doesn't mean it makes, it, forgiving doesn't mean it, make it makes what they did right. It just means you're not going to let that hold you back anymore from all God has for you. You guys receive that? Yes. Let me pray for you. Lord, we thank you that you forgave us when we didn't even know we needed it. So I, I pray for those this morning that, man, maybe we need to be reminded of just how much was forgiven so we can forgive others. I pray for those this morning that are carrying a heavy weight of something that was done against them, and it's just been eaten away at them. I mean, maybe some of them, it's causing physical harm in their body. Lord, I pray for deliverance today of that physical harm as they let go of the unforgiveness. And we just believe, Lord, you want us free. You want us walking free and clear in that spring of life that you give to us. We pray that we would be able to guard our heart for from, from it flow all the issues of life. We thank you for your forgiveness. If you're here this morning, you've not accepted that forgiveness. God wants to offer that to you. He wants to forgive everything you've ever done, set you up with an eternal address with him. And starts when we say this prayer that I'm going to say in just a second. If you say it and you mean it with all your heart, God's going to transfer you out of the kingdom of darkness, forgive every sin, and put you into the kingdom of light. Let's all say this together. Lord Jesus, we repent of our sin. We turn from our way. We turn to your way. Help us walk in your truth. Hey, if you just said that prayer, welcome to the kingdom of God. Get started on the journey. Check in with us back here and let us uh, know you made that commitment today. We're going to help you with some resources. You guys, I pray you'd be blessed. Bring a friend next week as we continue talking about how complicated relationships are. You're, you're dismissed. If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.